Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of uh, Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we are doing part two of the series titled The Identity of Jesus. Uh, if you haven't seen the first episode, uh, it's, you can go to my channel, Sin City Preacher, and it's posted there. Uh, we're going to today pick up kind of where we left off last time. But first I'd like for, for all the panelists uh, to introduce themselves. Uh, and uh, they're going to tell you just a little bit about their channel. And I hope that uh, anybody watching, if you are not already a subscriber, that you'll you'll subscribe to uh, all, all the channels of, of these panels. They're, they're, they've all got a lot of good things to say, so I recommend them all. Now let's start with Eve. Hi, uh, my name's Eve. My channel name is Eve Well, yeah. and uh, my channel is basically to encourage the saints and to um, give a different perspective on things um, and to speak about the grace uh, that it's not by works. So that's pretty much it. Nice to be here. Thank you, Luke. Okay, glad you came, Eve. Uh, and next we'll go to uh, Jay Byron. Uh, my name is Jay Byron. I go by Joe or Joseph, Jay, whatever. Uh, my channel is uh, primarily a, just a, a fellowship channel. Uh, YouTube is kind of my church. Uh, I, I look at YouTube kind of like a coffee house more than a church. And uh, you find a good table, sit down, and enjoy the conversation. Uh, I like weird things. I like to consider things that are rarely considered. And the identity of Christ is just a, an awesome topic. But I think we'll spend eternity and not fully understand it. But uh, I'm real privileged to have been asked to join. Okay, brother. Thank you. And, and uh, next, we're going to go to Brother uh, Jackson. His channel is called Mecha Wing Zero. All right. So my name is Jackson, and I um, I'm 21 years old. I like to I like to analyze things. I'm I'm a super analytical person, and I haven't uploaded very many videos yet. Partly because I'm I'm in college right now, and it's really hard to find the time to do these things, but I really like to analyze like like something that's already been written typically and talk about all the points and what my give my thoughts on it and everything. Um, I, I also ha have Asperger's syndrome and uh, ADHD predominantly inattentive, so fitting in with the crowd has always been something that's very hard for me. And due to due to the obsessive tendencies and stuff that I have, the Lordship Salvation uh, uh, position has re really driven me to all kinds of, of depression in my life and everything, and so I'm trying to just em embrace the grace of God, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Amen. I'm, I'm, brother, I'm so glad that you and so many of uh, the others have uh, broken free from the shackles of Lordship Salvation, uh, no longer in bondage. So I'm glad you know the truth and you're, you can rest in the arms of Jesus and just enjoy this blessed assurance. Uh, and now we're going to go to Brother Mitch. His channel is uh, Mitchell Belenkoff. Which is my name. <laughs> uh, you can <laughs> you could find me on Luke's channel if you want to look for me. He's got, he's, he has me on his channel, so you can find me there. Basically, I also have Asperger's Syndrome, and it was one of the reasons why I, I uh, went on to YouTube, because of uh, Lordship Salvation and the way it had uh, oppressed me personally. But when I really found out the grace of God and the truth of God and, and, and found out the, the, the wonder of the, the true gospel, uh, it just lightened my heart. And I wanted to share uh, that on YouTube with other people with Asperger's Syndrome so that they can, they can uh, those that were put under the, the whip of Lordship can be freed. Yeah. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Sister Tanya. Her channel is Galaxy Dreams 3. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Galaxy Dreams 3. I'm on YouTube. I make vlogs about uh, just my life, my Christian walk, things I learn, things I question, and I share it with everybody. Uh, and I like to try to encourage people um, in Christ and Reminds people that you know they don't have to earn God's favor; that He loves you, and you know, and that's it. <laughs> okay. And uh, if anybody's watching who uh, doesn't know me, uh, my channel is Sim City Preacher, and uh, I'm 
primarily an evangelist, and my, my channel and my ministry is based really on a, what I call a three-legged stool that I rest on, and that is the, the deity of Christ, uh, the, self, the fact that salvation comes by faith alone with no other requirements, uh, and that once we're saved, we're always saved, we can never lose our salvation. So those are the three legs of the stool that I rest on, and I defend those doctrines primarily. Uh, and there's a hundred other theological subjects that I like to talk about, but I don't want to argue about, but they're interesting to discuss. Uh, all right, we're going to begin now, and I think that we we ended the last show talking about Colossians 1, 15 through 19, and there are a couple of key words in there that I think that uh, we need to... Uh, go back over again. I, I like to get everybody else's input on these words, too. Um, it says, uh, he is the Im image of the invisible God, first born over all creation. Uh, and then later it goes on to say that, uh, in verse 18, it says, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So here we have this term, this word, firstborn. And you, you may or may not be aware of this, but uh, there are some cults, um, probably more so the Jehovah Witnesses than anyone else, that will take this word firstborn and try to turn it into Jesus being a created being, not eternal God. So how do we, how do we resolve that uh, in answering what firstborn is? And uh, I'm going to pose the, uh, uh, make the premise that Firstborn is not talking about actually being born or created or having a beginning. Firstborn refers to uh, as um, when you talk about all of the genealogies in the Bible, it talks about the firstborn. Firstborn is a title of, of uh, showing that you have a particular status in the family, and that is that you have you uh, pre have preeminence, you have uh, more authority. Have, you have the greater share of the inheritance, uh, and you have the uh, supremacy. So when Jesus is referred to as firstborn of creation, it means that he has authority and preeminence over all creation. It doesn't mean that God created him first. And when he's firstborn from the dead, uh, that's talking about the fact that he was resurrected, and then he's going to resurrect everyone else at some point in time. So um, any, let's start off and get anybody's feedback on this word firstborn before we go any further here. So who wants to go first and just wave your hand or say something? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, I think that uh, firstborn is traditionally, uh, from what I've noticed in the church, uh, referring, they refer to his physical birth or his... Uh, uh, incarnation. Uh, other people uh, who deny the deity of Christ use it as a creation phrase. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there are other people that uh, simply say it's unfathomable. We can't, we can, we can't comprehend it, but we can apprehend it. We know that he's part of a triune God, one God. And uh, I, I put forth a kind of a unusual uh, theory about you know, how Eve was taken from Adam and, and Christ may have been taken from the Father, therefore he was pre-existent and always part of God, but not necessarily a separate personality or a separate persona within God uh, until a certain point. And again, that is way, way far away from doctrine. It's just a, a thought. And uh, I had considered it and kind of raised a little bit of uh, ire from a few people because of it. Just a thought. Okay, uh, I, I want to uh, uh, go over your idea more thoroughly a little later, but uh, I, I want everybody first to just give their first response to this this term "firstborn" and see if if you uh, think that my uh, representation of it is correct or or if you need to correct it anyway. Uh, Eve, what do you have to say? Um. Well, first, Luke, can I ask you what uh, what chapter and book you said Colossians, right? Yeah, I was reading from Colossians 1. Okay, I just wanted to know where we were at. Verses um, 15 through 19. Okay, okay. Thank you. Um, 
I believe firstborn actually means several different things. Um, I do believe that Christ, um, and people might differ, but I believe that he was the first um, fruit as well. Uh, so I kind of see that as interchangeable with firstborn, um, and I see it as um, him being with him being in the flesh, first man that's reconciled uh, to the Father. Okay. The, um, the place that I, I think that uh, I, I want to defend, and uh, I think that I, as well as I know everybody, I, I believe that we all agree that Jesus Christ is the eternal God Almighty. Now, how we explain this, uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinity, through the Trinity, or modalism, or anything, any other way. There's a lot of different ways we try to figure out how to understand it, but traditionally it's been referred, called a mystery, because it's hard for us to understand. And was it Paul that said that we only see things partly now, and someday we'll see it completely? Uh, who, who knows that verse? We see through a dark glass uh, currently, but someday we'll see as we are seeing something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think there are some things that as much as we want to, we'd like to understand them, uh, we're never going to really have a complete understanding. And maybe in eternity, God will reveal more and we'll understand it more completely. Uh, uh, okay, Brother Jackson, what do you have to say about this, this word, firstborn, relating firstborn of creation and firstborn from the dead? Um, I think that... Uh, I. I'm not exa entirely sure how to explain the fact that it says firstborn of creation. I'm I'm a little confused as to what that means. I always took when it said that God sent His only begotten Son in in John 3:16 and stuff to mean that He was begotten by by Mary and everything that He was sent into the world and that then He was begotten by Mary. Let me interrupt just for a second because I don't want to um, mislead you by misquoting this. The, the verse actually says in the KJV it says is the image of the invisible God firstborn over all creation. Oh, see, that, that makes a lot more sense. All creation. So I think that should give you a better idea of what it really means. <laughs> okay, yeah, that, that, that's, quite a bit, that's quite a bit easier for me to wrap my mind around. But I think, um, I don't think the fact that he was begotten disproves what what, 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 I, what I call eternal sonship, the eternal sonship of Christ, because I don't really think he was begotten until he, until he was sent. That's why God sent his only begotten son, and he was begotten by Eve, or by, by Mary there. And um, I think that when he created Adam and Eve and the, the world and everything, he was still the son at that time. Well, the, the word begotten is something we're going to get into uh, after this. Uh, but uh, yeah, basically, you're, you're taking the point that begotten refers to his archaic incarnation as, as baby Jesus. Right? That's how you're saying that. Then. Uh -huh. Okay, uh, Brother Mitch, firstborn. Firstborn. Well, I have to look at the Old Testament um, idea for, uh, in, uh, that, that was put forth at the time of the Exodus when the firstborn of, of the Israelites was supposed to be killed by the Pharaoh. And uh, that curse came upon Pharaoh himself when Moses, when Moses said that you have spoken it. And, um, and this is where they started to put the lamb's blood on the doorposts of, the, of, the, of each house to protect the firstborn. So the firstborn in a household is the one who is able to inherit. So those who are able to inherit are the, the firstborn. Um, in, in such a case, Jacob, uh, Jacob was not the firstborn, but his brother sold his inheritance for a bowl of soup. So when I look at firstborn and firstborn over all creation, what was being said there was, "He is my son. That is, that is, um, in my only son and my my first son, my inheritable son over all creation." So when I look at that idea of firstborn, it it, it, uh, it it totally refers to the idea of being uh, an heir. Okay. All right, Tanya? Uh, 
I was looking at the scripture there, and yeah, I would agree with Mitch that it, I think a lot of it has to do with inheritance, uh, Jesus being, you know, the firstborn or begotten son. Um, it's about inheritance. And also, uh, when I was looking at the scripture there, it said, you know, that uh, I don't know if it was saying that he is the firstborn from the dead or if it's, it's referring to the church, but the fact that Jesus did die a human death. Uh, and then was born again, you know, resurrected. Uh, it could be, you know, that that he was first born from from the dead. Well, this this particular verse, eighteen, it says, "And he." This is referring to Jesus, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So, now, here's something else that's going to relate to what we're talking about. So that in everything, he might have supremacy. Supremacy. This relates to what Mitch was, was saying and, and the position I posed, uh, and that is that firstborn is a, a status that is uh, and someone who is the firstborn of the family. They have a particular status. They have supremacy, authority uh, in the family. So uh, it, I think it refers to his uh, ultimate authority, uh, his uh, over creation, the firstborn over creation, over creation, meaning that he has authority over creation, and then the firstborn, when it refers to uh, the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that everything he might have supremacy. So, to me, that that supports the idea that it's not talking about him actually being created, as, as some people wanted to. Uh, State that this firstborn means that he was born and came into creation and he's not eternal. Um, all right, let's um, first, now we're going to, I want to ask um, um, Brother Joseph to present a little bit more. You, you, you touched on it very, very briefly, your concept about Eve and Adam and relating that to Jesus and the Father. Present that a little bit. You don't have to do a 10-minute video on it, but, but give it a, a good explanation, and then I want we can all discuss that. Uh, well, thank you, Brother Luke, uh, for the interest. Uh, what I, you know, this just it came to me as a thought when I was uh, doing some reading in, in uh, Genesis and, and other places in John. It it talks about Christ. It says everything that was created was created by Christ, uh, and the Son, and and I. It seems like it's a position that was pre-incarnate, that he held that position of sonship prior to the incarnation, uh, is my feeling. Uh, and, you know, we know that there's one God, and we know that there's three persons within the triune God. And when I was reading the passage on when God uh, created Adam, he created, created him as a whole being, uh, 100% full, fulfilled and eternal. Uh, and what happened is, is God said, well, you know what, and he knew this before he did it, but he said, you know what, it's good that he have a helpmate, somewhat for companionship, for fellowship. And he took Eve from Adam. He didn't breathe breath of life into her. She was already alive. She was pre-existent within Adam. He didn't take dust or anything else to create her as he did all of the other uh, animals or life forms that he created. He, she was pre-existent within him. And so when he took Eve from Adam, he put her in a subordinate position to Adam, but yet equal with her. He was, she was a part of him, and he said, be one, you know, the two of you be one. It wasn't talking just uh, physically, I believe it was talking spiritually, because they together were one. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, you know, Christ, it says, was the firstborn. He had a position of sonship in heaven, I believe and a position subordinate but equal to the Father. Uh, in other words, he uh, was equal to like Eve is equal to Adam. I think Christ is equal to the Father. And it just dawned on me, he, when he said, make man in our image, maybe that is how, now I can't explain the Holy Spirit, but maybe that's how Christ came about. He was pre-existent within the Father, and a part of the Father was set aside for fellowship, like Eve was set aside for Adam for fellowship. And Christ was always pre-existent within the Father, but actually he made a part of himself for fellowship, communion, 
and creation. The, through him, all things were created. Uh, and through Eve, the furtherance of mankind was created. Do you see what I mean? And so it just seemed to fit in kind of a musical way, if you will, uh, that maybe, you know, maybe that's how things worked. I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I want to ask everybody if they see any uh, thing that kind of glares out as a potential problem with that, uh, that viewpoint. Um, it, it seems, I mean, I, I hope I'm not misunderstanding what you're saying, Joseph, but um, it seems like, therefore, you're saying you don't, or maybe maybe I'm, I'm jumping to conclusions that you're at, like we already talked about advocating a point of view, and really you only just have an idea, but it seems like if someone were to take that point of view, they would have to say that Jesus wasn't always the Son, that the, the, even though you said, you made clear you think he he was the son before he was incarnate, that he wasn't always the son, like, from the eternal beginning. Is that correct? Yeah, I, un I understand the, uh, the church's stance historically on the, on the pre-existence of the son, or the, uh, that Christ has always existed, and, and there is no further explanation <laughs> necessary. And I understand that, and I've always stood with that. Uh, and I'm not making a doctrinal issue of this, and I'm not presenting it as uh, revelation. Okay. It's just something I thought, it, how all things were created through Christ, and it, how when he created Adam, he made Eve, and all things created, all mankind came through Eve. Nothing, no one was created except through Eve. And it just seemed to me to flow or fit with, with uh, Christ being taken as a, a part of the Father, being set aside for communion and for creation, I just seem to flow. Let me say something that came to my mind. Uh, it, it, the, uh, maybe someone can tell me where this is, but I believe there is a scripture that says that uh, we were all in Adam at one point. All of mankind was in Adam. Uh, I, think you're, I think you're referring to Romans chapter 5. Okay, um, if you, can you paraphrase the actual verse? Because I think it's making the point that we were in him genetically, as eventually we'd be coming from his genetic progeny. Well, well, uh, if if you're referring to, to Romans five, I think what we were speaking about that that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and this is and it, basically what Paul was getting at was that not only Jews were under the law, but also everybody <coughs> was under the law because everybody died. Since the death has reigned since Adam to Moses, so um, so in, in that in that case we're all part uh, 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 connected to Adam through the fruit that Adam ate, the the fruit uh, in the garden, um, you know genetically. So um, um, you know that, as far as that scripture is concerned, I, I can't think of any other scripture that said we're we're does all. Anybody else, uh, does anybody else know uh, of a verse that, that supports what I just said? That I I. I it just came to me, so I, I didn't have time to research it to try to find this verse. But I, I think there's some verse that poses the idea that we, all, all of us, existing now, every person who's ever been born, existed in Adam at one point, and that would be kind of the same kind of idea that that uh, the son existed in the father, which is a point that I think uh, Joseph is is making there. Uh, but the problem that I, I see in it is. Um, we, we, I don't think there's any scripture that tells us that Jesus existed in the flesh uh, in, from the beginning of time, in, in eternity. Now we know, and we discussed this last time just a little bit, the idea of Christophanies, how, how uh, Jesus would appear as a man, or God would appear as a man, that's called a theophany, as a man throughout biblical history, even before the birth of Jesus as the baby Jesus. So there are cases where God manifests himself as a man, uh, but there, I don't think there's any verse that says that throughout eternity, back before time was created, that Jesus existed in the flesh as a body. Uh, there's nothing really that says that, so as far as I know, all we can do is guess. We know that uh, their Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are eternal, but in what form did they actually exist, we can only guess. Tanya? Yeah, 
I did. I was just going to say, I don't think that Jay was saying that um, Jesus has always existed in the flesh. I think he's basically just trying to wrap his mind around the fact that Jesus has always been, however he is uh, God, however he is specifically the Son. You know, that's like, whoa. But, uh, so I get what he's saying, um, and also a scripture that came to mind when you were talking, Luke, was how it talks about how we, the church, were, were always in Christ. So, yeah, we all seem to be in something and, and have been since the beginning of everything. So if we were always in Christ, then we always existed too, sort of. Oh, I think you're referring to, oh, hold on, uh, we were chosen in him. Uh, that uh, chosen in him since the beginning of time. Yeah, we were chosen in him. That doesn't say we were in him, but we were chosen in him since the beginning oh, okay. of time. Um, so I don't know if that verse actually says that we were actually in him since the beginning of time. But, uh, you know, so, the, and, and then if you look at the idea of uh, where it says in Romans uh, 9, it talks about, being predestined, you know, and even in, in, in Ephesians chapter 1, we were predestined, um, you know, uh, to be in him. So we were part of God's plan. So I think that that's what that uh, Ephesians chapter 1 is, is, is talking about. Hey, let, me, let me relate this to, or Eve, were you going to say something? Um, well, I'm sorry, I can't raise my hand because my image is up. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that... Uh, Mitch, that all kind of goes back to him being uh, firstborn, too, because uh, the only reason why we inherit is because we are in the firstborn who has inherited. So, um, yeah, I, I just thought that kind of went back to that. Um, I actually agree with Jay, but I do think that, um, I do think that, and I've told Tanya this, this, the Godhead is something that I don't like to debate with people. I do like to discuss it, but not debate, because um, it's something that I believe is spiritually deep. And um, so it, it's, it's not, I don't fully understand it, so I'm not going to debate something that I don't fully comprehend. I hope you don't take this as a debate. We're not debating it. We're just we're trying to... Uh... Uh, he posed an idea. It's worth talking about. Uh, a lot of times I come up with, I think, oh, this is an epiphany. I, this is a great way of viewing it. Like I, I explained the Trinity as, as a, uh, the human, a man was created in God's image, and man is body, soul, and spirit, and so therefore we're an image of the Trinity, God being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, I mean, I came up with that, and I know it's not a perfect... Uh, example of the Trinity, there people can poke holes in it, but I came up with it and, and presented it, and uh, we should be uh, free, not have to fear uh, like being, uh, uh, you know, chastised, just ex expressing an idea, and then, then we can talk about it. Uh, but when we, the, the idea of, of um, we use the word essence and substance in the last session here, and to talk about this idea of one. Uh, Jesus said, um, my Father and I are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And this, so this oneness is, um, some people say it's oneness in that they are one and the same. They just change form. God changes from Father to Son to Holy Spirit, depending on how he wants to operate, in which mode. Um, and some people say, no, they're one in agreement. They're of one mind. And, and then other people say, no, they're one in substance or essence. And I think that relates to the kind of the point that uh, Joseph was making, is that you have this one God, and uh, I think that saying that he came out of the Father might be a uh, confusing part of it, but you have this one God, this essence to this God. And then we all agree, I think, that uh, he, all three persons are distinct and, and uh, are eternal, they're not created. Therefore, the all three, and that makes my point about love. Remember I made the idea that last time that love, the Bible says God is love, and love cannot exist without an object. So the, the Father had to have an object to love, which is the Son. The Son had an object to, to love, the, and so on. So they, there had to be this uh, simultaneous existing through eternity 
And we want to defend the idea that Jesus is eternal, not a created being. So the idea of uh, being one, it could be one in substance, one in essence, and that kind of uh, goes along with, uh, Joseph, I think what you're saying. You had this one God, this substance, and you called it the Father, but I think it's better just to say it's the, the substance of God, and then uh, Jesus uh, is, was... Uh, Came out of that. Came out of that. But uh, he, yeah, it's it's hard to hard to explain it, hard to figure out, and we're probably not going to have a real satisfactory answers to some of these things. Okay, before we go on, does anybody else want to say anything about this particular point? I I did want to mention, uh, Brother Luke, that we do know uh, in Revelations 22 that in the eternal city, uh, where God will dwell, that will be heaven, uh, that there are two thrones. Uh, one for the Father and one for the Son, the Holy Spirit being incarnate. So that we do know the Father and the Son in whatever form. We know that the Lord is 100% man, 100% God. He has taken on human flesh eternally. But there is a throne for the Father. Uh, and because there's not one for the Holy Spirit, it would tell me that it's not a metaphoric phrase, but rather literal, that he will have a literal presence. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let me pose one other idea here. Uh, that I thought of recently. Uh, this is an idea, like Joseph posed an idea, and he left himself open to questions. So maybe you want to question me on this. And that I, w I got this idea for I was talking to a Muslim. They're saying God can't have a son. Uh, and I, I said, first asked the Muslim, I said, do you have any children? He said, yeah. Do you have a son? He said, yes. I said, so you're saying that you can have a son, but God can't, so you must be greater than God. You're saying you can do something God can't do. That was my first point to him. But the idea of son uh, being, um, is the son a less than the father? Now, you pointed out that Jesus temporarily put a, took a subordinate role in, in the flesh. Uh, but uh, my question is, I have a son. His name's Mark. Uh, now, first of all, uh, as far as you know, you think that I'm 100% human being, every person here? Uh, I'm not sure about that. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, knew I, I, don't want to I was going to get a wisecrack from Mitch, right? <laughs> right? So I'm not I'm not just 50% human being. I'm 100% I'm human, right? Now. Right. My All son. right, it's debatable, but okay, if you say so. <laughs> Please concede that point. <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, I have a now, lot of conceit in that point, but... <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I have a, a son, and uh, I think we'd all agree that he is also 100% human being. Now, am I greater than my son? I'm, he, I'm no more human than him. He's my son, and he is completely 100% human, just as I am. And that, to me, makes the point that uh, Jesus can be the son of the Father, and he's still equal, equally God. When you have a son, your son is equally human. When God has a son, uh, he is equally God. He would have to be. That's a good point. Right, I've never heard that analogy, but that's very good. I like that. And then you could further say that a son is under the father's authority for a time until the time comes when the, when the son is on the, under his own authority. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now I promised in the promo video of this that we're going to go through Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, it's my opinion it's one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. Uh, so uh, let's do that one verse at a time. And... Uh, We'll t take as long as we need to to go through this. Okay, uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Okay, uh, let me, I like to read things, uh, even though uh, I prefer the King James, and I like to look at other translations sometimes. It's just easier for me to understand. I'm going to read a paraphrase called an NL, NLT. It says, same thing, same verse. Long ago, God spoke many times 
and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. Anything need to be said about that? That's pretty self-explanatory, right? Yeah, I'd say so. Okay, so now we'll go on to verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. I'll read the paraphrase and then we can discuss it. It says, But now, in these final days, he has spoken to us through his Son. Uh, God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son he made the universe and everything in it. Okay, so how does this relate to, is there anything in this verse here that isn't significant to know the identity of Jesus? Um, uh, definitely, uh, uh, is there something like this, that, 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 that through the sun, you know, uh, everything came into the being? That's a, that's a pretty uh, bold claim. Okay. I, I, Joseph? Uh, I, I thought it was just struck my uh, uh, curiosity, not so much as I don't have a statement on the issue, but uh, I certainly am fascinated that in the last days he speaks through his son, and prior to that in the Old, in the old Testament, I assume, he spoke through the prophets, and it almost appears that God the Father spoke through the prophets. I know it was the Holy Spirit in both cases, but I, 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 I'm fascinated by the difference or the separation between verses 1 and verses 2. Yeah, yeah. I, I, really, um, I, I really also see that, Jay, because it's interesting how now that Jesus isn't walking the earth right now, we just have the record in a book and everything for us to read, but... It would have been kind of interesting back then. It'd be like you see somebody on the street, and he says, "I'm a prophet of God." And if he's a true prophet of God, you actually learn it that way. So that it just, I guess, shows the difference in how the nature of how man, um, how God interacts with man, changes and stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I've always liked to use the analogy when, as far as scripture is concerned, they say that man wrote the Bible or that God wrote the Bible, and I say, well. Uh, God used man to write the Bible just as just as I use a pen to write. God used man as his pen to write it out. And, uh, um, but now this is saying that before it was the prophets, and now what we have is, is uh, these last days he's spoken us by his son. Uh, now is there a Anybody else want to say anything on that before I uh, bring up the next point? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to just bring up something. Him being called the Lagos, the word. Uh, and the way he spoke to us was by his action on the cross, by his by what he did on earth. Surely he spoke through the Holy Spirit, and when he left, he sent the Holy Spirit as a comforter. And that what happened beforehand was the Holy Spirit testifying testimony through the prophets of him to come, because everything that that happened was 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 pointing towards. Him fulfilling that in the flesh, and and so those things I think have to be considered when you say in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son. How has he done that? In the fulfillment of what the prophets spoke about him, he came, and then after he after he came and was fulfilled, he is now still speaking through the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is still pointing towards him, but not forwards now, but now in history. Mm -hmm. And when you said the word logos, well, before I go on, leave. Yeah, I you, just... You don't have your video, so I want to make sure I keep on thinking of asking you. Uh, thanks. Uh, I just wanted to say, you know, he did mention logos and uh, Christ. I'm just going to make it short and sweet. Christ um, is the word. So um, it, it's just, it, it's like, I don't know. I just wanted to make it short and sweet and just throw that out there. He is the word. Okay, uh, that's where I wanted to go next. It's kind of the companion verse to this, and it's, it's in first, it's in John one, uh, but the first uh, 
Tanya or Jackson, you want to say something before I move into that? I think I've already stated what my thoughts are in my response to Jay. So. Okay. All right. Now we're going to go to uh, when it talks about in Hebrews that um, um, who has appointed heir of all by whom also he made the worlds. So this is saying that by through Jesus, we uh, God made the worlds. Now we go to. John chapter 1, and it says, In the beginning was the Word. We know this is referring to Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So here we have an eternal, a claim of eternal existence of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, not being a created being, but being eternal. Um, just as eternal as the Father. And then it says, uh, The same was in the beginning with God, now here in verse 3 it says, all things were made by him, Jesus. All things were made by Jesus, and without Jesus was not anything made that was made. Thank goodness. Yeah. So we have uh, in Hebrews and also in John, not only this claim of uh, deity, but this claim of being the creator. So the, we, we need to understand, to the, uh, when we look at the identity of Jesus, he is our creator. The creator of everything. Nothing was made that, except it was made by Jesus. All right, I'm going to go on to verse three unless someone wants to add to that. No, oh, yes, uh, of course I always have something to say. <laughs> it it actually says, and I, I spoke to uh, some people who um, are of the Latter Day Saints, and they said. Um, oh, yeah. You know that 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 are there's that there was always going will there always be a prophet? I said, well, I don't know if there will always be a prophet, and and so some of this whole idea of them saying there's a there's a, their prophet today, but as far as um, their Jehovah's Witnesses are also concerned, they say that the word was a god, and it's very specific in the Greek. It doesn't say that God uh, it, that that the word was God. It said God was the word. Theos and Halagas. Uh, so in Arche, in the beginning, in Halagas, que Halagas, in in Arche, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and in, 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 uh, and the Word was with God, uh, or Prastan Theon, que Theas, that God, in Halagas, God was the Word, and so when you translate that, they try to add an article to that, and and it, uh, it's unescapable actually when you really look at the way it's stated in the Greek. I just wanted to bring that out. Well, the, the Jehovah Witnesses, when they wrote their New World Translation, uh, first of all, they had no scholars uh, really they even understood Greek uh, when they wrote it for Hebrew. But they, uh, they did, they, their purpose was to write out of the Bible anything that identifies Jesus as God. But they did a pretty poor job. Uh, they just put the word A in there, thinking that would solve the problem. Jesus, uh, the, the word is a God. In other words, he's not the God Almighty, but we're going to see as we study study along here. He is the God Almighty, uh, but he they also failed throughout their their New World translation. You could still use the New World translation and show verse after verse where they they, they neglected to write up his deity. He's still there. Uh, yeah. Now let's let's go to uh, the third verse of Hebrews one, who talking about Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory. God Almighty, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the world of his power, the word of his power, when he had when he had by himself purged our sins, so we know again this has to be talking about Jesus, Jesus is the one that died for our sins. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So here we have it killing the idea of modalism, that God exists in one form, he changes forms, but one form at a time. We have the duality of the Father and the Son sitting down next to each other simultaneously. Uh, uh, I'll read that in this NLT. I think that's pretty obvious is what it says. Though. The Son reflects God's own glory, and everything about him represents God exactly. He sustains the universe by the mighty power of his command, 
after he died to cleanse us from the stain of sin, he sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God of heaven. Okay, so what did we learn from that verse there? Who wants to go first? It seems to have them as equal in authority to me when he says it's at the right hand of the Father, or at least very close in authority. For example, the right hand man, I guess I guess technically he was below the king, but he was very, very close in, in how much authority he had and would work very closely with the king, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so are you are you um Questioning whether there is um, equal equal authority uh, in, in the eternal state, either either currently, we know that Jesus, uh, as he took flesh, uh, that he uh, took a subordinate role to be a servant of the Father, a prophet, and so on, and die for our sins. Uh, but that was a temporary way setting aside of his complete uh, powers. Uh, are, are you suggesting then that the in, in this present tense and in eternity, that, that Jesus has a, some subordinate role to the Father? I've um, I've wondered about that for a while, actually. Um, I'm not I'm not entirely sure. Anybody have any idea on that? Well, I do want to say um, I've heard people bring up the passage that. Jesus will eventually rel relinquish the kingdom to the Father. Um, however, I've always counter, kind of counteracted that with the um, verses that talk about Jesus' kingdom will be forever. So um, I just wanted to kind of throw that in there for food for thought. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to speak on that too. Um, as far as as far as um, in the Old Testament, with Joseph, who was second to the Pharaoh, but he had all the authority. As a matter of fact, he was given Pharaoh's ring. Is anybody else having that audio problem? Is that just me hearing? Where? I have a slight audio problem too. Yeah, Mitch. Uh, the last of uh, 20 seconds when you spoke, uh, it was all like jumbled. I don't know if there's something happened with your sound effect. <laughs> all right, hold on just a second. Maybe if I get closer to the source, you can hear me better. Uh, yeah, but the problem is we can also see you better now, too. Okay, yeah, we're probably too far away from the... Oh, my, please. Um, when we look at um, Joseph, who was a picture of Christ also, he was, he, was, he, he was given authority by the Pharaoh, but he was also given... Uh, I guess you lost me again, right? No. You're good. Okay, he was also given Pharaoh's ring. You know, like his stamp to be able to do. I think I believe he was given the ring, but he he was given all the authority, basically second to the th to to Pharaoh, but at the same time still all the the authority. So, um, um, and in that case, I would say that the that the father, uh, and, and plus being part of the father. I mean, uh, if I was a, a the father and I sat in uh, in the role of being the father, and, his son, and my son sat at my right hand. For all intents and purposes, uh, the father and the son are the same. You might say, that, "Well, is there? A, uh, am I above the son or below the son? Equal, equal to the equal to the father?" But it just seems like all the orders that were put out and, and the order of, of of salvation and everything were all in agreement with one another. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how much authority the father really needs to wield over the son, since it's all been put under the son. It's as if I, I handed a company over to my son, and he runs it now. He has full authority. But in that case, that means that originally you were the one, the, if you give, give it to your son, that means originally you were the one with the authority. Like, it says in, in John 5.26, the King James Version, For as the Father hath life in himself, so he hath given to the Son, to have life in himself. It does seem like there's some different delegation going on here, to me at least. Uh, I, I think you're right about that, but I also think that because they were in agreement from the beginning, it wasn't as if there was so much authority, even though he does exactly what the Father wants him to do on right. earth. 
there, there was so much in agreement between them that he was basically saying yes, yes. So, uh, so I don't know how much weight you want to put on uh, the father being above, as much as they were all being one spirit together and in one agreement with one another. So I don't know how that all translates to authority. When, when, when my father tells me something and I already am doing it because. I'm in agreement with him. It's almost as if he never gave me an order to begin with because I'm just carrying out his mm -hmm. will. Uh, mm -hmm. But yet he, he came to, the, to earth and he was subordinate as a son for the very purposes of doing the Father's will and then, and then exalted back to the throne in heaven. So, you know, and I don't want to speculate too far on, on, on where, you know, the authority is, whether they were actually perfectly equal to one another and in what way. But it does seem like, as far as authority is concerned, since they were all in agreement with one another on, on what they were going to do or what the plan was from the beginning and that everything that was made through him, it just seems like it's kind of petty to think of, uh, of him as being lower. Yeah, I would, I would say, and this is just my gut, because I, I can't think any scriptures necessary to prove the point, but I, I would think that uh, pre-incarnate uh, and... Um, after the resurrection, it was, it was, in other words, with the exception of the time of the incarnation of Jesus, uh, they were equal, uh, and that, that they, if they if they did different roles in any way, it was because that was the agreed upon thing by them jointly, as, as uh, Mitch said. It's it's uh, they were in agreement. Okay, Tanya, you're going to say something. Yeah, I'm just. Uh listening to you guys and I'm looking at the verse that you were talking about, Hebrews 1-3. Um, I wonder if, you know, because um, God, nobody, the Bible says nobody's ever seen God, okay, because, you know, if anybody did see him, we wouldn't be able to handle it. We'd probably, like, just die or whatever. I can't remember exactly how it states that, but um, so... And that makes me think of this verse here where it says, and the express image of his person. I wonder if, you know, Jesus, um, oh, I'm starting to fuss, I'm going outside. Um, <laughs> I wonder if Jesus, you know, being born in the flesh the way he was and stuff, was the only way God could present himself to humanity in a way that we can actually uh, tolerate. Do you know what I'm saying? So, so yes, Jesus is God. We know that. We're, we're just sitting here trying to figure out how it's possible that Jesus can be the fullness of God also. I don't think we're going to get there, guys. I really don't. I think we're, we can try to figure it out and, and share our ideas. And, you know, I think they all might have a little bit of truth to them, but this is, this is deep stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Uh, the idea of not being able to see God is something that we can discuss uh, later. I've looked into that recently, but that's going to take us off a little bit from where we are. Uh, let me ask you here, when it says in verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory, we've been talking all along in the last session about his glory. God gets all the glory. He doesn't share his glory, and yet Jesus has all the glory too. So that, that we conclude that Jesus has to be God to be having all the glory. Uh, and then it says, and the express image of his person. What does it mean to be the express image of his person? And it says here in the NLT that the Son reflects God's own glory and everything about him represents God exactly. That's how they would rephrase that. In that, in that uh, paraphrase. If I could, I would just, I think that when it says express, express, you know, um, that it, that has to be for us to understand it. So to express to who? To us. You know, God doesn't have to express himself to anybody but us, really. So I think that, that I think that's what that means. I don't know if that makes sense. Can I pull that from, from Isaiah? Um, in Isaiah it says that he had no form that we should regard him. He was considered stricken, smitten, and afflicted. So, you know, when we talk about him being glorious, he wasn't like an angel. He was like a vessel that was um, 
like we carry around this truth in a, in, in a clay, uh, just a clay vessel. So the ex this, the expression of his glory um, was was something that wasn't seen by the people, unless of course the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to see him. Moses had glory also, so um, and the glory was fading, and this is also mentioned in Hebrews about the fading glory that Moses had, but the glory of Christ being uh, uh, never fading. So. Um, as far as uh, the expression or the express, the, um, you know, being expressed as as God Himself or the glory of God, it it wouldn't have been in in, in such a way that it would have been that you would you, you would have fallen, um, you know, down on your knees or to your face to see like the in the presence of an angel, and yet well, also uh, what you were saying about not being able to stand in front of God's presence, the reason why we can't do that is because of sin. And you can look at scriptures where John, uh, or or when uh, what was it the prophet that 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 uh, was it Isaiah, he couldn't stand before God, but he got a coal, a coal from the the fire, and burnt his lips, to to make him clean. And John was stood up uh, by the angel, but basically uh, people stood before the Lord because Adam and Eve did, but because of our sin we can't stand before God. So I really believe that in in, when we're totally cleansed of our sins and uh, we are able to stand before Him, we might shudder a bit, but 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 honestly, we can we can come boldly before God because of the covering of the blood of Jesus Christ. Hey, do you think that this verse here is a companion verse to uh, Jesus' claim, "If you've seen me, you've seen the Father"? Yes. Possibly, yes. I would say so. Can, can I also interject here that <clears throat> I believe that <clears throat> the express image uh, and what you guys are talking about, uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, it's not about our physical eyesight. It's about truth. Amen. This, this uh, uh, he, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, I have people that probably don't like me because I don't stick entirely to KJV. A lot of times, when you look at other translations or even the paraphrases, uh, if people, like we're trying to express this in our words and try to figure out how to express it, and, and in the paraphrase, that's what they do. They try to express the same thing in the way that we can understand it. But in this paraphrase, it says, the sun reflects God's own glory, and everything about him represents God exactly. So is that what it means? Is that what it means when it says, you, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? I, yeah. What I see, Brother Luke, is it, it does several things. One of the things it does is call attention to the duality uh, within the Godhead, uh, separate personas and uh, separate positions and unity in thought. Uh, now, indeed, you've got to remember that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all perfect. And in perfection, they would have to be in uh, common uh, or the same mindset, if you will. So if, if Adam and Eve, for instance, prior to sin, I think operated in, uh, in perfection, there was no disagreement, there was no problem with subordination, different roles, and uh, I think this is uh, the way it is with God, that uh, there are different personas that are in complete agreement because of the perfection that exists within them. Okay. Um, I was thinking about something, and now I had one of those things where you go, the thought disappears. <laughs> Sorry. Senior moment. That's what yeah. we're Hey, I'm not a senior. <laughs> I'm not 65 yet. All right. Sorry. Senior. I thought it was 55 was the cutoff. Uh, thanks a lot, Jack. You're going out to hurt me. Okay, so now it says, uh, so so far in this in Hebrews, it, it, it's declaring that Jesus is the Creator. It's declaring that He has uh, all the brightness and glory of God. And he uh, reflects the exact image of God. And it says, and upholding all things by the word of His power. Upholding all things by the word of His power. What does that refer to? 
I think that's just uh, talking about the word of God and how, you know, that that is the power. One thing that confuses me a little bit, though, is when it says the word, obviously sometimes it's referring to Jesus. And other times it seems like we refer to the word of God as the Bible, the book. So I, 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 don't, I never know how to distinguish when I'm trying to read a, a place like mm -hmm. that, read something like this. Well, I'm more, I'm more curious about what you say about, it says, upholding all things by the word of power. It says here in this other translation, it says, he sustains the universe by the mighty power of his command. And it says in the NIV, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Um, I often thought about that one also, um, the spoken word of God. Remember when, God's, when God created, what did he do? He spoke. He said, let light be. Uh, he spoke things into creation. And so, so um, by his power, by his word, his word is his, it, it, actually, as he speaks, it's, it's power that does. And so when I say that, that, that Christ is the word, it's actually the spoken plan of God, the the um, spoken creation of God, the speaking through the prophets of God, and it, it, it's more encompassing than just me saying something. It's well, actually something that's, that's spoken into being. Brother, before I forget, because I, I'm forgetting things right now, before I forget, are you saying when God said, spoke things into existence, it said, for example, let there be light, that was Jesus Christ saying those words? Well, it was through Christ. It was through Him, and I don't, you know, I don't like to be pinned down. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> but, okay, Jay Byron, what do you say? Was it Jesus Christ that said, "Let there be light"? I believe it was, uh, and and here's why. Uh, I I believe that uh, through Adam, Eve was used to create all men forward. I believe it says that all things that were created were created through Christ and so I think that it was his spoken word but I'm also a lot like uh, not uh, Mitch but uh, I, I'm sorry uh, Jackson and I'm kind of a little bit perplexed because you remember it says Jesus is the word the word was with God or but all scripture is God breathed through the Holy Spirit so there's another intermingling of the word. Let me Literally. shed light on that. That that that's possibly the whole idea of let us create man in our own image. Let us create man in our own image. Could it have been could it have been one speaking that was treble or three? Could it have been all three of them speaking? They could have said, said all three at the same time said those words together. <laughs> in one yeah. spirit, in unison. Yeah, yeah I think that the, the word I believe what uh, Jay said. Jesus is the Word. The Word. Okay. And so God spoke us into existence, and we also are in His image, and we have all of the unspoken things about us and traits about us, like how we love. We can love without saying a word. You know what I mean? It's like within us, you know? I don't know how else to explain it. Okay. Um, we'll go on to this next. Part, if we finish with that, it says, when he had himself purged our sins. Eve? Um, yeah, I just, uh, I don't, I'm really kind of speechless right now. Okay. Joseph? When he had himself purged our sins. Yeah, I, I think that that denotes the person of Christ, which I, I steadfastly uh, stand that he is, he is while part of God, a separate persona and a separate role, and I think that was one of the roles of, of God uh, in the person of Christ. Maybe the roles thing, too, helps, uh, helps bring into focus what I was asking about earlier with authority, like to... I think this is basically what Mitch was saying earlier, and this could be this could be illustrated here too. 
that uh, that in other words, it's kind of like yes and yes. Like they do have different roles, but they're both mutually agreeing a hundred percent to those roles. Um, I do I do want to say something because you know when we were speaking earlier and I said um, that the express image and uh, it, you know um, is that it's truth. Um, I also wanted to say, and and it didn't. I didn't catch it. Um, I, I didn't say it, but afterwards I thought, man, I should have said that. Um, that he's also um, expressing that image through love, and part of love is that he laid his life down for his friends. Um, that's the. Um, I, I can't. T I have a hard time explaining my thoughts, so I'm sorry. But I, I think you, I think as you were saying, because doing that action isn't necessarily. He didn't really speak that action. If you see what I'm saying, it's something he did. Is that kind of what you mean, sort of? Me right. Connect. Well, I think kind of love. Sorry, Luke. Go ahead. I'll connect the dots here. Uh, the Bible says God is love. And Jesus said, there is no greater love than laying your life down for your friends. And then Jesus laid his life down for us. So that's the connection which you could say, well, therefore, if God is love, if there's no greater love than dying for your friends, and Jesus died for us, therefore Jesus is God, is love and God. Mm. Yeah, I think we want to speak about action and word here. Um I think that the action was spoken into into the action of everything that happens in the world in the universe was spoken and upheld by words and planned by words almost as if I made a blueprint for a building I didn't build the building yet but I made a blueprint for it but then when the time came for it to be built actual construction of the building happened as per the specifications of what was on the blueprint so when Jesus came and fulfilled the word, and I have come to fulfill the law and I've, of the prophets and fulfill the word, being the word, his actions fulfilled what was spoken. Mm -hmm. Okay, I like that idea. I've never heard that before. I, I really like what uh, Tanya said. I, I'm dwelling on it, and I've been kind of sidelined by it, because she said something I've never thought of. Uh, it, the spirit is the unspoken word of God. Uh, the will, the, the I, I can't put it into words like Eve, I guess, can't, but what she said really stuck with me. Uh, the Spirit is kind of like the unspoken word, uh, and I don't know how the Father fits in there, but the, the Son is who, through all, the, all this unspoken word, is channeled through for creation, for expression of the Father and the Spirit. Now, let me ask you, when you say the Spirit is the unspoken word, um, has anybody here uh, actually heard the Spirit speaking audibly? I haven't, but if I could just say one thing real quick. Uh, just to snowball off of what Jay said, I, I agree with what you're saying, and it makes me think of the, the fact that the Holy Spirit is the comforter and how the Holy Spirit makes us, you know, have comfort and peace in Christ, and he does it without speaking. It's something that, like, is within us, or whatever. Okay, so nobody's, nobody, because I, I, I have other friends on YouTube that told me that they thought they've actually audibly heard God speak to them. I, I've never heard him audibly, but uh, I think that the, the Spirit has spoken to me through uh, what the Bible calls promptings of the Spirit and grieving of the Spirit, the transforming power of the Spirit to urge us on and, um, and also convict, convict us of guilt if we get off track. So I, I have uh, felt the, the Spirit communicating with me that way, but not audibly. So has anybody else? Uh... Well, I don't think the Holy Spirit has to speak to everybody, but I do think that everything and the communication, by the way, uh, isn't something that we might see. Like DNA is a communication. My, your DNA is a is a blueprint. Is it? It's and and it is a written code that's that's written down. So um, yeah, there are things that are unseen and hidden. But I do believe that everything everything had every little molecule that exists and 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 below that 
has all been like every hair on your head is numbered has all been numbered and put in place and and planned and so since it might not have been an audible communication it may have been an audible communication but I do believe that it was all a word a communication that set everything into its and, and it sustains everything and moves everything and predicts everything and then there's the execution of that plan that happens it's almost like a a program, a, a macro or a computer program where it's put together and it, it, it happens exactly according to plan. But not only does it happen, but what also happens is, is that every element is being controlled at the same time. Because you have to realize that God upholds everything. And so not only is he the one that set it into motion, he is the motion that, pu that puts things into practice. Uh, and so I, I think it's, it's beyond what most people could... I could even fathom that that everything is controlled and planned and spoken of by an incredibly powerful, intelligent God. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to move on to the final part of verse of this verse three, uh, unless someone else wants to add to what Mitch just said. Okay. It says, "Set down on the right hand of the Majesty on high." Okay. Is, is there any, what, what do you feel is the most important thing to learn from that verse? Hmm. Well, it's what not at the that? left hand. It's at the right hand. Uh, I think that's a, that's very important because that's a, that's a position of authority. Okay. And maybe sitting down is, in a way, resting being finished. It's what Jesus did, he finished it. So now he can sit down and relax. <laughs> I okay. Yeah, I, I think both of those are very good valid points. Yeah. It's not the one I had in my mind. But anybody else have something else to there's something important to learn from that verse. Those two things are both important, but anything else? Well that we're no longer working, are we? Since the work was finished. We don't have to add to what he did. Uh, I we've well, some, of, some of the panelists weren't here in the first session when we talked more about modalism and trinitarianism, but this is this is one of the arguments I have against modalism is that uh, they believe that this one God uh, changes forms and, and he's he only operates in one form at a time. Sometimes he operates in the mode or manifests himself in the mode of Father. Sometimes. He manifests himself in the mode of Son, sometimes as Holy Spirit, but only one at a time. And uh, we pointed out before that the flaw in that thinking is that there are too many examples we can give of uh, two people or even three people simultaneously having a conversation. Like the baptism of Jesus, we have Jesus in the flesh being baptized. We have the Father's voice coming down saying, uh, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. You have the Holy Spirit ascending above uh, uh, Jesus in the manner of a dove. So you, in this case, and then you have this case of him sitting down next to the Father. You have two of them on the throne uh, existing simultaneously in this dual state. So uh, this to me is a, is the importance of this verse is that tells me that, that no, modalism, even though there's a lot of good arguments for modalism and they give Jesus full credit for being God Almighty, uh, and yet they don't, they don't, will not um, accept the uh, the distinct existence of these three persons in this God in the Godhead. Luke, Luke, can I also say something? Um, I just wanted to bring up the verse where uh, Christ um, is said to be here on earth and in in the spiritual realm at the same time. I'm going to try to find that verse. All right. Uh, if you you think you'll find it right away, or should you? You want to find it and come back to it. I'll, I'll just I'll find just... it and come back. Brother okay. Luke, if I if I may, brother Luke, while while she's doing that, uh, real quick, uh, I would point out Revelations chapter twenty-two, verse three, 
and uh, it said, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And it's talking about the holy city, and his servants uh, shall serve him. It, it, it clearly points out that there will be two thrones within the holy city. Yeah, I, I understood how modalists explain the um, explain the, the both the right hand of the Father and the two thrones, like you brought up, and everything. I mean, I guess maybe the only thing I can think of that they would say is he duplicates himself and appears simultaneously in two different forms. And if he's God, he can do that. But that seems kind of strange. Brother, I'm not able to uh, fairly represent their side of it on this. I will tell you. That I've heard their explanations for these things, and uh, I just think their explanations are are, are weak. Uh, they're, they're not very convincing to me. So that's why I haven't been persuaded over to modalism. Uh, I can see that their their answers to these these uh, uh, simultaneous inter interactions between the the, the God and the Godhead uh, is there's not a good answer for it. So I, I have to assume that no God exists. As three distinct persons simultaneously, and he doesn't just simply change from one to the, to the other. Uh, you were going to say something, Eve? Well, I just, uh, and, and I don't take any, like I had said before, I don't take any labeled position on, on this. And um, again, I'll, I'll just repeat myself. I do think that it's so deep that I, I'm not going to ever fully comprehend it till I'm with the Lord. Um, but. That that's why I'm wondering about the verse that I'm talking about, and I'm I'm still trying to find it, where it's talking about Jesus being present here, but also present there, and so with that verse, uh, you know, it kind of just it's just uh, mind blowing. Well, the omnipre the omnipresence is an attribute of God that all all three of the persons of. of the Godhead would would possess. Uh, so, uh, God the Son is in flesh uh, and will forever have that. But yet, uh, as an attribute of being God, He also would have omnipresence. Well, that's uh, that's something I'm sure I agree with Eve that we can't comprehend. We just have to accept it. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know how Jesus in the flesh can be omnipresent. Well, that gets us. That's why you brought up the subject here. There, there are three common um, attributes of God that uh, God gets credit for. And one is uh, omnipresence. God is everywhere. So if that's the case, then God is in hell. Uh, and and uh, God is in every molecule, and God is everywhere. Uh, and then, uh, then you all, but also people can take that to, to uh, justify the. The doctrine, the theology of pantheism. Uh, but then you've got the other uh, doctrine besides omnipresence, you've got omniscience. God knows everything. Now, I've often wondered if you know everything, if you ever get bored because you're not, you never learn anything. It's exciting learning something. Do you think you'd ever get bored if you're just omniscient and you just know everything? I, I can speak to that. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! I mean, you know everything that's ever happened and everything is going to happen before it happens. This is so, a sarcastic you know, comment, right? There's no, there's no surprises. Well, is there really not any surprises? I mean, because Moses prayed for the people and actually changed the mind of God. Yeah, but yeah that is God. that's often cited that that verse that that he changed God's mind. But did he change God's mind because it was planned to be changed? Yeah, I agree. Obviously, yeah. if God is omniscient, he knew he was going to change his mind. The other question, of course, then you've got omniscience, omnipresence, now you've got omnipotence. Omnipotence means God is all-powerful. He can do all things. And yet we have this, uh, what is the, the dilemma or uh, paradox, and what is and God created a rock so large he cannot lift it. Yeah, we've I've, we've also heard those um, ideas that 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 is God uh, like all powerful, but he can't do something that he ordains. Uh, 
that he can, you know, but in, in my eyes, that's, that's a moot point because um, that's the way God made it. He doesn't, doesn't have to be this concept like, um, like you say, that are all things, uh, uh, you know, um, what's that, um, absolute. There are no absolutes. Are there no? Are there absolutely no absolutes? I mean, you can you can you can make a good argument that way, but but to, to, but basically, when we talk about uh, om, omnipotence, uh, you know, uh, unlimited power and and uh, omniscience and all of this this stuff here, and we look at the world about us, and we see that the universe is running like a clock, and we don't know who's running it, then. Uh, you know, I guess you can you, you you can get the idea of how great and powerful God is, and I don't think anybody can really wrap their minds around. That's why he's a god of mysteries. How how big and powerful God really is. I don't think anybody can really wrap their mind around it. Yeah, I would just say I would just say there is no rock. There is no what? There is no rock. There is no Art. spoon. Right. <laughs> that was yeah. a bad joke. <laughs> hey, Luke, I found that verse. Can I read that? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, and, and this is uh, Jesus speaking, and it says, it's John 3.13, and it says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Just that last part where she's saying he is in heaven as he's as he's standing on earth speaking. Yeah, he he's speaking that. Yeah. It's yeah. just I just think it's deep. That's why I had to bring yeah, it up. Yeah, it's very deep. I have never really uh, the I never linked at the very end of that verse to what you're saying. I just it kind of like all those things you read a hundred times and, and you, you, you miss it, and then all of a sudden it's either. Uh, Get an epiphany, or Eve tells you about it, or somebody tells you about it. And then, wow, we explain that one. Yeah, that's a good verse. I think that just you know goes to show that how Jesus is God. I think that's just uh, evidence of that sort of. Eve, right. when you brought when you when you brought up this verse and everything, what what um. Is this a verse you're, you're using to prove the, the deity of Christ, or is, are you talking about something else? I don't quite remember when you first went to go look for this verse what the, what your point was. So. Well, I just wanted to kind of, what Luke was bringing up was the modalist, or however you say their, their names. Modalist. Um, modalist. And how they, I, I guess what they believe, I don't really even know what they believe, but I guess what they believe is that um, God only operates in one person at one time, or, or what have you. Is that what you were saying, Luke? Like a transformer. Yeah, that's what I said earlier. Yeah. So I just thought of that verse because it, it just shows that, that Christ was in multiple places while he was present upon the earth. Yeah, I would, I would, uh, I would, I would uh, suggest that he. I, I don't understand that verse. It's perplexing me because when Christ uh, chose to or was sent by the Father to become man, doesn't it say that he laid down his? He didn't give up, but he laid down his divine attributes of omnipresence, omnipotence, uh, everything. You know, he became a man dependent upon the Father. While uh, through this journey of of, sanct or of saving us, am I mistaken there? Can I say something to that? I, it makes me think of, and I've just been studying this, so this is interesting. How heaven, when you think of heaven, doesn't necessarily mean some place somewhere else. In the sky. Remember, yeah. yeah, remember Jesus said the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. I can't remember which one he said is within. So. You know, it's it's a spiritual thing. Uh, I don't know. It just made me think about that. I, I was actually getting ready to say basically the same thing, Tanya, that um, I, I could attempt <laughs> to explain this verse by, by suggesting that, you know, with the kingdom being within, um, that it's... See, I believe it's a type of parallel universe. I don't think that heaven is beyond these clouds and planets somewhere and it is a place. I believe it's parallel with us. So um, that that's just how I would look at it. I'm surprised you didn't know that it's at the North Star. 
So, so uh -huh. it's kind of like a parallel dimension then, heaven? Um, that's how I would see it. I mean, it, that's just my personal belief. It's not something that, you know, I can just sit there and, and debate or, or pull up scripture and say, this is why, this is why. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. But, but yeah, that, that's interesting. That's like the, the comic books I've read and stuff, where there's different dimensions of things happening simultaneously, so. Well, when I uh, made that statement, uh, Eve, uh, with my usually my jokes fall on deaf ears and I end up only amusing myself, but uh, it, I really did recite that because uh, Dr. Ruckman, uh, he has this theory that uh, the throne of God is a physical place that is located out in the direction of the North Star, and of course he defends it, he, he backs it up with some scriptures, but uh, I'm not concluding that's the case, but the idea of it being another dimension, that's certainly feasible too. Uh, uh -oh. these, are things, these are things we might be able to study and we, we might be able to come to some conclusions and, or we might just end up saying a lot of interesting theories on that. Who knows? Uh, can we go on to verse 4 now? Anybody have anything else to say before we go on? Yeah. yeah. I, I would like to add that uh, while I agree with what Eve said about it being a separate dimension because angels appear, materialize, dematerialize, whatever, I think that the Bible teaches that our dimension becomes God's dimension in eternity. It says he destroys the current heaven and earth with fire and recreates it. And the holy city uh, upon the newly created earth is the eternal place where God will rest and make his kingdom. Yeah, uh, yeah I think it's pretty clear in Revelation stating that uh, the, the new heavens and the, the, the throne of God, the new Jerusalem will come down and Describe how it's uh, that its dimensions and it comes and rests over in Jerusalem, uh, but that's another subject. Let's move on to this next part, which is I'm really uh, very anxious to get into. Verse four says, "Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they." Um, and then the paraphrase says. Uh, this shows that God's Son is far greater than the angels, just as the name of God uh, gave, just as the name God gave him is far greater than their names. Uh, I know Mitch is going to talk about that, his name. Hmm. Uh, but the point is, uh, we're getting to get into a port. This next portion coming up is very, very important in order to refute the uh, Jehovah Witnesses who claim that Jesus is an angel. In fact, he's Michael, the archangel. So, and keep that in mind as we go through these verses here. Being, uh, uh, and it says in the NASB, it says, having become as much better than the angels, and it says in NIV, it says, he became as much better, much superior to the angels. Uh, so the idea of being made so much better than the angels, as it states in the KJV, being made, uh, where is the potential problem with that wording? I, I really think it's a, it's not a, a creational statement. I think it's a positional statement. And I think, it had to do, I think it had to do with what Christ accomplished. You see, mm -hmm. his name would not have meant anything if he hadn't accomplished anything on the cross. For if Salvation was, if Jesus, Yeshua, God saves, didn't do what he did, then his, his name would not have been made anything, because what was accomplished was what was done on the cross. So I really don't think he was made, what made everything is that he, he said, it is finished, he did a work, and that work made his name greater than anybody, any angel, because it had to do with us entering into the kingdom of heaven. Through what he what he accomplished, his name Yeshua, God saves. Amen. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. Me too. Uh, it, it says in uh, this the message far higher than any angel in rank and rule. Uh, he had become. Um, well, the, the the potential problem was would be me. <laughs> Is that they're going to claim that as a uh, being made as a, 
that he's created being. So you have to understand that it's not talking about him being created, it's, it's, it's his status, his standing, as uh, Mitch says. And then, but he's, he's being compared to the angels. In other words, as we go on, it's going to even make this more clear that uh, he, he's not an angel. There are angels, and then there's Christ. He's not one of them. They're separate, totally different. What is the verse that the Jehovah's Witnesses use to try to say that Jesus is the Archangel Michael? Because maybe it'd be helpful to to uh, to uh, clarify what that verse actually means. Mm, I don't know off the top of my head, but uh, I'll look that up. But go I've, on. Got, I've got that, but I don't, I don't know. Um, okay, what about uh, a more excellent name? What about his name that is ex so excellent? Okay, well, as far as, I'm sorry, as, as far as angels are concerned, an angel's name, or an angel can't save us, but his name, being God himself and God saves, is definitely a more excellent name than any angel, but also it, 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 an angel is a created being. And what, what Christ was, was he was... He was made to be, even though he was he wasn't created, made to be lower than the angels, and then died on the cross and was resurrected. So his his name was always God, but it's not just that that his his name was God. His name was the glory of God happened on the cross. No angel could have done that. <coughs> All angels were 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 were, uh, were in subordination to that. So he had. If he was an angel or a person that lived a sinless life, and I think I mentioned this before, and they lived a sinless life, but they weren't God Himself, would that would would that and th and that name or that person saved us from our sins? Wouldn't that person get the glory? But no, God got the glory because God was the one that did the work. So it, it just would be out of place if some person lived a sinless life and said, "Oh, now you know, Harry Krishna lived the perfect life and hung on the cross." So now we should pray to Hare Krishna because he saved us. So, so I mean, the whole idea of, 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 of God saving is, is the majesty of God coming down and God himself actually becoming a sin for us and dying on the cross and then being exalted. And I think that that's the very glory of God. It would be out of place if it was any other way. Let me, let me read something from Philippians that r r relates to this. Uh, Philippians 2, verse starting with verse 6, uh, speaking of Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made him uh, Joseph, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. So here it's saying that he made himself of no reputation. It goes on. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And the way we're referring, now we go to Hebrews, it's talking about this name, this more excellent name than angels. It's a name above all names. And then Mitch has talked many times, and I've mentioned this numerous times in my videos, the importance of the actual name, Jesus, Yeshua. Before Mitch goes off on that, I want to see if anybody else can expound upon this idea of Jesus' name. Uh, I would. I, I don't know if this has anything to do with it or not. I'm just thinking out loud. But na a name is a word to describe somebody. Like, it's a word. And God is the word. I don't know. That's all. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that all throughout the Bible, as you, you look at everybody's names in the Bible, their names describe them, like Jacob is trickster, and, and uh, Barnabas is son of encouragement, and so on. There's an, every name seems to describe the person perfectly. So, yeah. the name yeah. Jesus, uh, who can tell me how you translate the name Jesus? What does What is the meaning of that name? Isn't that I've God saved thing? myself. Sorry. What? I said, I save myself. Am I right? 
I Let do see what else can get it, Mitch. You, you've written books on this. <laughs> what, well, does um, the word, what does the word Yeshua literally translate to? God saves. God saves. It, his Jesus' name is God saves. I like to say his name means God who saves. Jesus is God who saves. And that idea is that we're putting in our faith in God to save us, and if this God is Jesus, we're putting our faith in him to be our savior, uh, not in a religion or our own, own abilities. Uh, Mitch, why don't you, I know you have a lot to say on that. Well, you know, I, I thought it was, was uh, you're out of luck because you have to go save yourself. I, I, I'm... I'm <laughs> <laughs> I think I said enough uh, about that. Uh, I mean, uh, it's self-explanatory, but but yeah, um, yeah it def definitely means means that we don't save. And and so many churches and even the Jewish faith have gone back to Moses and and thinking that and even even under Moses they weren't saved by their works; they were saved by the blood of the sacrifices, looking towards Christ. So when Christ manifested Himself. They didn't recognize him. They wanted to go back to them saving themselves. And that's what happens in lordship churches, and that's where everybody misinterprets the Christ for the Antichrist, the one who doesn't save. And so, so his name, there's no other name under heaven that you would be saved by, but by God saves. And so it's so mysterious how the Bible calls it right on, the, right, on right dead on and says to you, God saves. Not you. Well, there's a verse that says uh, uh, we we have salvation by believing in His name, right? Believing in His name, and there's a, another one says it's the name above all names. That there's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. So this name, in particular, is important uh, that uh, we understand what His name means, and, it, and it, the importance of it is that is God who does the saving, and God, this God has manifested himself as this person, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, and is therefore our Savior God. That's why whenever I refer to Jesus, I, you'll always hear me refer to him as my Savior God, uh, because that's what his name really means. Um, okay, we'll go on to verse 5. For unto which, of, unto which of the angels uh, said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten me. <laughs> well, there is a, certainly a refutation, a refutation of the claim that Michael is the son of God, the archangel. Jesus is the archangel, uh, Michael, the son of God. It says, For unto which of the angels did, said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten me. Mm -hmm. So here we, we can see clearly in these verses here, Jesus is not an angel. So if you're a Jehovah Witness out there, just read this verses right here in Hebrews 1, 4 and 5. It goes on talking more about this. But it clearly states that Jesus is not an angel. That's one of the most important things of the first chapter of Hebrews. It tells us he's not an angel. Uh, and then it goes on, and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Um, and then we, we, there, we find that word begotten there. You know, I don't know how many times the word begotten is uh, in the scriptures. John 3.16, or only begotten son. And here we have begotten. I gave you my idea on begotten earlier, whereas, whereas uh, my son Mark is begotten, but he's equally human to me. I'm not any greater or more human than him. He's equal. And that's why when Jesus said, uh, my father and I are one, if you've seen me, you've seen the father, what did, was the Jews' reaction? 
No. They, they were going to stone him. Yeah, they are going to stone him because they said, you make yourself to be God. You're claiming you're equal to God. So, because when you say you're the Son, you're equal to the Father. My Son is equally human to me. Jesus is equally God as the Father. Also, I don't think they understood that God's Word, the Word of God, is God. I don't think they understood that either. Who are you referring to? Well, I'm just, it just makes me think of, you know, because everything Jesus said was the Word of God. Oh, you're talking about the Jews. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about the Jews, okay. Oh. All right. Joseph, were you saying something? Uh, I wasn't, but I was thinking something. Uh, you know, the rabbinical uh, uh, belief system of, of Judaism uh, looks forward to the coming Messiah. And so I think they do recognize that a son of God is coming. They just didn't recognize Christ as being that. <coughs> yeah. Okay, um, we're going to go uh, to verse 6. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. So what is this verse, what's, what's important to learn from this verse? No, it's obvious that, well, that the angels, oh go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to say the angels don't worship anyone except God. Yeah, so any Jehovah Witnesses here, the scriptures tell us that God is saying the angels should be worshiping Jesus. And also what comes to my mind is when, when Thomas uh, realized that Jesus was, was, uh, was God, uh, he says, I'm not going to believe he's resurrected until I see him and touch him, put my fingers in the wounds. Jesus appeared to him, and then when, Jesus, when Thomas saw him and touched him, Jesus, Thomas got on his knees and said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Yeah. And Jesus did not correct him and say, don't refer to me as God. Okay. So, um, and Luke, can I just yeah. say uh, one thing real quick is that the angels, you're right, Jesus did not correct him. Uh, the angels always corrected people who bowed down and started worshiping them and, and told them, you know, I'm your fellow servant, get up. Yeah, that's true. There's many examples we could cite of angels saying, saying, and, and, and Paul also, too. Paul, when they were trying to worship Paul, I think at one point, uh, uh, or maybe it was Peter, but, but uh, uh, they denounced him, no, we're just men. And then the angel says, no, I'm just an angel. I'm not God. God don't, don't, don't worship me. Jesus accepted worship. Uh, and verse 7 and of the angels he saith who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire but unto the son he saith thy throne O God is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom ok so it says and the angels uh, God made them angels to be spirits and ministers but it says, but to the Son, that's Jesus, he's, God is, Father is saying to the Son, he's saying to Jesus, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. God is saying to Jesus, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. How do we explain that except that God is calling Jesus, the Son, God? And he's telling the angels that he should be worshipped. Uh, I mean, I love I love John first chap chapter of John. You know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and lived among us. But to me, you've got basically four or five or six verses there that uh, that, that uh, really emphasize this deity of Christ. But to me, this is the chapter of the Bible that nails it down, and really, really nails it down 
that excludes any other any other conclusions. No, this is not simply an angel. It, it, it just says it so clearly. Um, now let's go to verse nine. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. What's that mean? I don't know. I'd like to get some of that oil of gladness, though. I, I, I'd like to. Can you give me some of that oil of gladness. I, I, I think that that would be. Uh, that would be better than some of the wine I've been drinking lately, but I think that that oil was an anointing oil, um, uh, 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 um, basically a, a fellowship with the, with the Spirit and a blessing. I mean, when you talk about an anointing with oil, you're talking about a blessing or a bestowing, or even in some cases, being anointed a king. Yeah, I was going to bring that up too. He's anointed as the king above... All humanity. It isn't oil also a reference to the Holy Spirit as well? Well, it is sometimes a reference, but you know, it, not always. It's just like fire. Uh, the word fire. Uh, sometimes fire is referring to lake of fire. Sometimes fire is referring to a uh, uh, let's say uh, going through some tri trial and tribulation as a fiery trial. Trials. So, I mean, yeah, oil doesn't always mean the same thing every time you find the word, but uh, it, it is uh, many cases used to represent the Holy Spirit. I, I think I think it might. I think also you think about oil being put in a lamp, and in the at the Pentecost, the 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 flame that was over everyone's head when they were were speaking in tongues, uh, but being anointed uh, by the Holy Spirit would be an anointing that would would also choose a king. Uh, so uh, I think that that, that uh, in in this case, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? allegorically? I think that, that that Tanya is right about that, possibly. I'd like to go through these remaining verses very quickly so that we can finish here within a, like a two-hour time frame. That I like the show to be, and so we'll go through it more quickly here. Um, um, verse ten, and thou, Lord. Um, by the way, Lord here, uh, I think if you look at this in, in the, the Greek, it's going to be kurios. And it's, it's not Lord in the sense of, um, um, a lot of times people use the word Lord and think it's, it means in terms of master. Like, let's say that you have a rich person that you work for, or, or, or someone would call Abraham Lord because he was rich and they worked for him. The Lord, or he's their, you're their servant. That's lordship, thinking of lordship in terms of, I'm going to serve him because he's the Lord, he's my master. But this is, when it's referring to the Lord here and throughout all these cases about Jesus, it's Lord in the sense of deity, God. Okay, and thou, Lord, in the beginning hath laid the foundation of the earth, this is referring to Jesus, and the heaven and the works of thine hands, they shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as a garment, and as a vesture shalt, shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Let's look at first 13. Uh, th th those previous verses were again reinforcing he's the creator. But in verse 13 it says, But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? It seemed like in Hebrews it's going out of its way to prove that Jesus is not an angel because apparently at that time some people were teaching that he was an angel. So they're really debunking that, saying, No, he's not an angel. Mm. Oh, um, really quick on that one. Uh, remember that this was written to the Hebrews, and uh, if Paul was writing this to the Hebrews, he was trying to show them who their Messiah was, because they were um, they were neglecting 
to see Jesus as being the Savior of God. They, uh, they were looking at him more as a prophet or because of the miracles, maybe an angel. And a lot of them were rejecting Jesus because they weren't realizing who Jesus was. So, so basically I think that this book was, this whole idea of this book was to, 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 to show who Christ is and to get away from Moses because they had their eyes fixed on Moses. And Moses was, was their, their great prophet. So, so now here Jesus comes along and they're minimizing him to be just another prophet or maybe an angel, but not the Messiah, not the anointed, not God incarnate, not the one that they came to save them for their sins, and not the one that was able to give them salvation, for they wanted to keep trusting in... Mitch? Oh, oh. Hopefully he'll come back and finish that thought here. So we realize he's gone. <laughs> but let me let me uh, uh, reinforce what Mitch is saying here. I, I've said that uh, I have a video asking people to tell me their favorite books of the Bible. It's interesting the, the various books that people cite as their favorites. And I I, I say that my favorites are uh, John, uh, Galatians, and Hebrews. And uh, John because it's all about uh, salvation uh, and uh, the, the deity of Christ, and, and Galatians because it, it debunks the, the fact that uh, faith is not enough. No, faith is all you need and don't add anything else to it. And then Hebrews because it basically does two things. It declares Jesus' deity in this first part. It debunks the idea that he's just an angel. It says, no, he's God. And it also debunks the idea that, that they need to keep Judaism too. As the, the remainder of Hebrews is all about getting rid of Judaism. Don't mix it. It's much like Galatians. And you can't mix the Judaism with this new thing, with, with Christianity, which is faith in the Savior. Uh, hopefully he comes back here. But um, did anybody want to say anything about this here? Verse 13 and 14. I'll read it one more time. But to, but to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering servants, I mean spirits, sent forth to minister for them uh, who shall there be heirs of salvation? Okay, Mitch, I'm glad you could make it back. Don't worry, I finished all your thoughts on that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, Mitch, if you, can, if you can remember where you left off, go ahead and, and make your conclusion there. Um, I have no clue. I was having a pre-senior moment, and uh, <laughs> you shouldn't have those. You're only what, 33 years old? Oh yeah. Well, I wish <laughs> a little older, but uh, but I. Okay, I, we're yeah, looking I, at the last two verses now of Hebrews one. Okay. Uh, and uh, I'll read it one more time, and then everybody can make their final remarks on these things here. It says, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? That's one point. And then the final point is, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So each person take your final point, uh, opportunity here to uh, expound on those two verses. Eve, you want to say anything about that? Um, well, I'm kind of dealing with my son right now, so you guys go ahead. Okay, Joseph? Well, I, I would uh, say that uh, I've been in discussion with some of the people who uh, believe Jesus was an angel, and they use, there's a verse in the Bible somewhere where it said uh, uh, Lucifer was uh, had a throne on, on God's left hand. Is, that, is there a, such a verse? Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, I think that they say, well, see, there was an angel on his left side, and Christ is an angel on his right side, and, and that's what I've gotten from them in the past. And of course, I don't agree with that, but that is a point they they do reference. Okay, Mitch, verse thirteen and fourteen. What's the importance of that point? Oh, um, you know, the angels were ministering spirits, but he was the focus of what the angels were ministering about. Yeah. I think, I think that wraps it up right there. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, and Jackson? Uh, I just pretty much fully agree with what Mitch just said, actually. That, yeah, they're ministering, but the object of what they're ministering about is key. For example... That's probably, the, that's probably a pretty good philosophy of life here. Just, just go ahead and say amen to Mitch. Yeah. No, please don't. Uh, no, please. Well, but 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 in other words, that that's it's just pretty much summed up what I what I'm thinking. So, okay, okay, that's good. That was just a joke. I don't. Please forgive me, everybody. When I try to be funny, I I, I know I'm a failure at it, but I, I would like to try. No, it's funny. It's just that I I come up with a lot of stuff, but but believe me, I'm 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 a stooge. I'm not really that smart. It's just that yeah. got this Asperger's syndrome. And yeah. times we like, think alike. We well, do. I, 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 I agree. With, I agree with Mitch almost a hundred percent, and that's the best I can say about anybody. <laughs> now, Tanya, what do you have to say about these last two verses here? Well, they just made me think of another verse, and I'll, I'll just read it to you. This is First Peter, one, verse twelve. It says, "Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto <laughs> us." They did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Oh, wait, this isn't. Oh, yeah. Which things the angels desire to look into. And um, I remember reading or learning about um, the, the, that the angels marveled when they found out, like, the plan of God, because you know how it's like a mystery or whatever. And once they kind of saw what was going on, they were like, whoa. So I just, it just, those verses made me remember that. So I think that's cool. Okay. Well, um, so this, so this finishes the first chapter of, of Hebrews, which to me is the most important chapter in the Bible to understand uh, the deity of Christ. Uh, and uh, when we, when we go, start again next time, uh, we're going to go back to continuing with the what I call these deity of Christ proof texts. I probably have about 20 more of those proof texts I want to go over, but the, most of those texts are uh, their statements uh, among among another message. Whereas this one, the entire first chapter is really all about the one thing. He's not an angel; he's God himself. He's the creator. You know, <laughs> so that's why. Uh, that's the best source for someone to really learn who Jesus is in terms of his deity. Uh, and then once we get through all those proof texts, uh, we'll do that next time. Uh, then I have a whole bunch of titles for Jesus that we're going to be reviewing. So we have probably at least a couple more episodes in this series to, to complete this study of the, the identity of Jesus. Um, okay, I'm going to give everybody a chance to say goodbye to the audience and any final uh, statement you want to make. Okay, uh, we'll start with Eve if you're, if you're available. Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, I appreciate you having me, Luke, and uh, I enjoyed it, and I think it was uh, a good talk, and um, I do think that there's uh, a lot of deep things within uh, that first Hebrews chapter, but it's kind of off subject, but it, it completely goes with what you were saying. Um, it shows that... Um, Christ is not an angel, that Christ is deity, so I think it was a very good lesson, and I appreciate you having me here to take part of part in that, and uh, I just want to say bye to everyone uh, who's listening. Okay, fantastic, and, uh, and I, I'm glad you were able to join me. I hope you can continue joining us in the future, and Brother Joseph, your final thoughts? Well, it just this is an incredibly important point. It, it, it's the basis of our salvation, the person of Christ. And uh, to anyone that finds that dry, just remember, this is, this is the foundation for everything past salvation. I mean, it, without this, we cannot be saved without understanding the nature of God and, and accepting the truths that are laid out. So... Uh, I just I'm just honored to be able to throw in my two cents and and uh, I've really enjoyed the, the discussion. Okay, brother, thank you for for participating, and brother Jackson. Uh, th thank you so much for having me, Lou. Uh, I feel like you know the question of who Christ is is obviously an extremely essential one because he this who he is depend or what he can do I should say depends entirely on who he is. 
So I'm really, I'm really glad for this discussion. I'm really glad for all the verses we've looked at. And thank you very much for, for letting me give my input and everything. Uh, if you want to stay tuned on my channel, I'm planning on actually doing a series. I don't know when I'll have time. I'm really uh, frustrated and busy with my schoolwork right now. But I'm thinking of doing a more in-depth um, analysis of the book that I have a very quick analysis of. So. Yeah, I, I encourage you to do that. The, uh, the, that's a very worthwhile thing. Uh, the, the video he did previously just touches on uh, a few of these teachers uh, that are they're famous people, uh, but unfortunately, they're they're all either some of them horribly wrong and some of them slightly wrong, and they need to they need to be corrected. So, uh, yeah, do a good thorough job on that. And brother Mitch. Oh. <laughs> I, thank you for uh, um, my senior moments. I know sometimes they. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, uh, I was going to say something, but I forgot. <laughs> okay, we're going to come back to you. We'll give you one last chance after time. Go ahead, Tyler. <laughs> uh, thank you, Luke, for having me. It's always such a blessing to participate in these. I just love them. I look forward to them every week. Um, yeah, I think that we, we did good. We covered a lot of stuff and I think we all learned a little something um, and maybe have some more questions now, which is always good and we can seek the answers and God's faithful to give us those. And I just want to say to the people listening that you can trust Jesus. You can trust him. You can trust him. Just trust him. Okay, that's all. Hey, Mitch, did you remember? Well, I just wanted to, you know, everybody's sharpening one another here. It, it's really a good thing that that that, that 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 each of us have, like, God has revealed to us or put us together so that this way we can we can kind of bounce things off of one another, you know. And I, I really like um, the topic, and I, I think uh, what Joseph was saying about the importance of this. And uh, what Jackson was saying about his, um, you know, the book review that he did on these teachers. And what I see mostly is that they seem to be halfway on the mark, but when it comes to the importance of, of who Christ is and how great his plan for salvation is, that he was the one that saved us, oftentimes I think that they're clouded and they don't see the real beauty of the gospel that saved us no matter what we do and gave us gave us his grace and gave us his love and basically just grabbed us by the heart and told us who he is not that we're that he saves and that we we don't save and that that's good news because if it was up to me I'd mess it up yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, thank God, praise the Lord, that he's the one that does the work. I don't have to think about what I do. I think about what he's done. I think that that's the major point that a lot of Christianity says, oh, yeah, what Jesus did on the cross, now let's talk about what we do. Yep. Well, we don't do anything without realizing what he did. And that's where we lose connection sometimes. I, mm -hmm. I guess that, 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 that that's the, if there was any point that I wanted to bring out most of all, is that we should rest in what he has done and, and and who he is is very important because if he's not who he is then how could he how could he be the one to do what he's done okay uh, I don't really need to add anything to that everybody has some very good final points to make uh, I want to thank all the panelists uh, I want to thank all the viewers uh, and I look forward to going through the comments uh, this will be uploaded onto YouTube immediately following the end of the show, and uh, I think everybody on the panel, I hope you all go look at the comments and maybe interact with those and answer the questions uh, or comments that we got. Uh, and I want to invite everybody, uh, not only the panelists, but everybody else uh, back next week. Uh, it's every, every Sunday, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. And uh, thank you for watching. Most of all, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.